Good morning from Miami Beach. Welcome to another episode of the Neuroendoscopy series done by Y.R. Yadav, uh, the president of the Neurological Society of India. Uh, and we have the very competent Narayan Swami from Jabalpur that's going to moderate. Welcome, Narayan. Good evening to you all from India. I'm, I'm John, it's good evening here. I'm sorry, <laughs> this time it's a lag difference. Uh, we welcome you all to the, the fourth series of the ongoing series of total of 12 topics to be discussed by none other than Professor Yadav, who has trained more than 850 neurosurgeons in endoneuroscopic surgery and has written a lot many articles. I want to remind you know that uh, Professor Yadav has written articles which has got more than 10,000 citations. And he has done extensive work. He has given webinars in all premium institutes. He conducts fellowships. He has done all the work possible what a neurosurgeon can think. And uh, what more? That no, that uh, let's hear from Professor Yadav. Along with Professor Yadav, we have light panelists. Professor Prakash Naya. Uh, he's from Sri Chitra. He's from the skull base and the internal surgery. He's an expert in doing cavernous meningioma. People have seen his life surgery and then they can only applaud him. He does wonderful surgeries. And Dr. Dattaraj, who does endonasal surgery and then extensive endonasal, expanded endonasal surgery, and then name anything on this earth. He's from All India Institute of Medical Science. And we have one most stalwart, Dr. Avdesh Jaiswal. He's from one more premier institute, uh, STPGI. He deals with almost everything, whatever even ENT person can do, he can do all these things. So thank you, every uh, the light members of the panelists, and thank you, Yadav sir. And I'm handing over the mic to Professor Yadav sir. We will have Professor Yadav's topic, and in case some panelists uh, feel like asking question, you can interpret in between. Otherwise, we'll uh, have panelists view at the end of the talk. Thank you, Professor Yadav sir. Thank you, uh, Professor Swami Narayan Swami for. Uh... Uh, for a nice introduction and I thank all panelists and I am grateful to um, Professor John for giving me this opportunity. Uh, today, I think I share my slide. So, So I'll be talking on endoscopic management of uh, uh, CSF rhinorrhea. This is a long topic and uh, um, uh, I'll try to finish it as early as possible. Uh, am I audible and the slides are also audible? Yes, perfect. Okay. perfect. Yeah. So we all know that uh, CSF rhinorrheas are due to communication between intracranial subarachnoid space and sinonasal mucosa. There is an injury to the arachnoid and also to the dura mater, the bone, and the nasal uh, mucosa. And uh, uh, this can be visualized in um, the, uh, the diagram. Uh, so to have a CSF leak, we have to have injury to the arachnoid membrane, to the dura, the, the bone, and the mucosa, then only the CSF will come. So why is this CSF rhinorrhea important? Because there is a risk of meningitis. And we all know that uh, if there's a meningitis, then um, there is very high risk of uh, mortality and morbidity. So the risk of meningitis when you have CSF rhinorrhea is 10% in the first three weeks. Uh, and then it is around 10% annually. Therefore, we must treat these patients. So initially we try and manage uh, some of them. I'll be discussing conservatively, but some of them may require early surgery and uh, some if the conservative treatment fails, therefore they should be operated to, to, to um, uh, prevent this meningitis. The endoscopic closure uh, is the most important and the most recent treatment now available, and it has revolutionized the surgical treatment. We had so many options, intracranial uh, uh, surgery, 
but the morbidity and mortality was high. And therefore, uh, this recent topic of endoscopic management we will be discussing today. Uh, regarding the presentation, um, uh, uh, we all know that uh, um, uh, there is a clear discharge uh, of fluid from the nose. Uh, it may be active or it may be intermittent. When the patient comes to you, there may not be any active leak. So there may be intermittent discharge of clear fluid. Uh, the diagnosis is by uh, so many things. Uh, including quick and state test. Uh, when you uh, when the patient comes to you, you can put uh, pressure on the jugular vein, which increases uh, ICP, and then there uh, the discharge comes. Then uh, there is another thing which you can do in OPDs that you can ask patient to bend forward for about a minute time. So even if uh, he or she is not leaking, uh, the, the fluid may come out. So, uh, but it is more uh, pronounced in the morning hour, especially when um, uh, there is a uh, leak from the sphenoid sinus. Uh, the hello or the double ring sign, especially useful in traumatic CSF rhinorrhea, in which uh, we have a central ring of blood, and the peripheral hello of CSF. This is, uh, I mean, I'm talking um, uh, for the resident and young neurosurgeons. Handkerchief sign can differentiate between the CSF and the nasal secretion because there can be patients. We have seen people who come with the nasal discharge and uh, sometimes it is uh, very important to differentiate whether these are nasal secretion because of allergy or otherwise some infection or a CSF leak. So the, if the, uh, the fluid is blown in the handkerchief and it is dried, then um, uh, the handkerchief does not stiffen if it is a CSF because there is no starch, but uh, it stiffens when, there, uh, when, when it is because of the nasal secretion. Uh, this is the example of uh, a double target or a hello sign, the central blood and peripheral CSF. Uh, the reservoir sign, uh, uh, you ask the patient to place a uh, chin on the chest that is bent forward for at least one minute. And then there is a discharge of fluid, uh, which you can observe it is a clear fluid. Uh, so, <clears throat> And then in such cases, you can suspect that it is a CSF uh, or a thick fluid, uh, maybe a nasal discharge. This can be unilateral. In most cases, it is a unilateral. So if you find bilateral leak, then you should suspect that there may be a, a nasal, uh, I mean, nasal pathology, uh, the allergy or something. So usually a unilateral leak but there may be contralateral leak. There may be injury on right side, but the leak may be uh, from the left side. So usually on one side, but the contralateral leak, although rare, but can happen when there's a dislocation of the midline crista galli, as shown here, the injury is on right side, the crista galli has gone on the opposite side, the leak may occur uh, from the opposite side. And when the meningo seal is blocking on the ipsilateral side, and you can have leak from the opposite side, there can be bilateral leak, especially if it is a post-op case and the nasal septum has been uh, removed. So you can have leak from both sides. Uh, the, uh, there may be early leak or delayed leak, early leak when, uh, when uh, uh, the leak occurs within 48 hours, uh, but if there is a delayed leak, uh, which may present uh, even after one week of trauma. So if there's a delayed leak, uh, you have to go for uh, surgery only. Early leak can be managed for, uh, I mean, conservative, especially uh, for traumatic cases. But there may be CSF leak, which are associated with high pressure leak. So in such cases, there's a classical history of intermittent leak and there is a headache. The headache is relieved when you have leak. 
So the the headache relieved after the leak. Uh, there may uh, it is suggestive of high pressure leak or a spontaneous rhinorrhea. Uh, most cases of uh, spontaneous rhinorrhea, not most, but around fifty percent of them have raised ICP. So they can present as a recurrent meningitis only, not only leak, but they may have recurrent meningitis. So you suspect. Uh, CSF leak um, uh, and work up for uh, that. The periorbital hematoma after the head injury uh, is a risk factor. Uh, these patients have a high risk of dural tear and delayed CSF leak. So therefore, if uh, uh, you come across such patient, you should ask that, um, please tell us uh, whether you have some uh, fluid discharge from the nose because some of the patient, uh, especially in our setup, they feel that uh, they have a, uh, I mean, uh, allergy or uh, URI, and therefore uh, there is a fluid discharge. So tell them that if there is a fluid discharge, especially in this subgroup, then this may be a CSF leak. And if the patient has obstructive sleep apnea, uh, there is a well-known association of th this condition with raised ICP and also uh, with the spontaneous rhinorrhea. Regarding the workup, uh, we need to know if, if there is a discharge of clear fluid from the nose. We first, the work which we should do is to find out whether the fluid which is coming out is a CSF or a nasal secretion or something. So that uh, you first need to confirm by the uh, test which uh, I'll be discussing later on. And then second thing is from where it is coming. So if it does not control by conservative treatment, we, know, we need to know from where it is coming and therefore we repair it. And the other thing, uh, which is also very important and it occurs in about 50% of cases are that there is an associated raised ICP. So if there is a raised ICP, we have dual responsibility. One is that you have to repair the leak site and then you have to treat also raised ICP. Otherwise, there will be recurrence. So regarding uh, how to differentiate whether the fluid which is coming out is a CSF or something, um, you can go for uh, glucose de detection using glucose stick test, which is commonly available, and most of us do it, uh, but it, it, it is not very specific and sensitive. There are false positive and false negative, which we all know the false positive may be there because of tear or nasal mucosa, uh, especially in diabetic. Some uh, glucose may be there in less than 10%. Uh, even if it is uh, the nasal uh, secretion or blood contaminated or patient with diabetes and stress hypo, hyperglycemia. Therefore, you should also have a corresponding blood uh, sugar level. There are also false negative. So these may, the glucose level may go down when there's a meningitis or intracranial infection. Um, so uh, we have known now that it is not specific, but it is very useful. So this is useful when you come across these three situations. If the glucose concentration is more than 30%, then it, and if there's no blood contamination, uh, contamination, then it is likely to be the CSF. So no contamination and the glucose level more than 30 milligram percent um, in a situation where you have constraint about the other test, it is almost, uh, I mean, diagnostic. And you should have a corresponding blood glucose level, uh, uh, two third of the blood glucose level in a clear uh, fluid indicate that it is a CSF. And if there is no glucose in the fluid or less than 10 milligram percent, then also it rules out that the fluid which we are dealing with is not a CSF. Uh, and the chloride concentration also can be a useful test. Uh, if the uh, concentration is 110 or more, uh, it is suggestive that it is a CSF. 
the specific tests are uh, beta 2 transferrin uh, is sensitive and specific uh, it is not seen in the nasal secretions unlike uh, blood glucose but it is seen in perilymph and aqueous from the eye uh, and you need very few drop but uh, it is not freely available everywhere the beta uh, trace protein also is specific um, and it is not present in the uh, serum. So uh, the contamination of the blood does not alter the test. Uh, regarding whether it is a CSF or the nasal secretion, um, uh, if there is a history of uh, nasal surgery, sinus surgery or tumor or a head injury, then it is more likely to be CSF. Um, the flow of discharge, uh, few drop or a stream of fluid which gushes on bending forward or restraining and that fluid cannot be sniffed back is likely to be CSF. Whereas uh, if it is a nasal secretion, it can be sniffed back. Um, it is thin, watery and clear. Uh, the taste is usually sweet, salty, and the metallic because of the content of the CSF. Uh, and if you have uh, more than 30% uh, glucose concentration, and obviously you have to con compare it with the blood sugar level. And uh, if associated, if you have beta 2 transfer in positive, then it confirms that it is uh, CSF. Uh, regarding the investigations, uh, you can have two situations that you collect the fluid, you ask the patient to collect fluid for examination. If you are able to collect fluid, you can go for uh, blood sugar, I mean, uh, the fluid uh, sugar estimations more than 30 uh, milligram percent or no glucose, then uh, that no glucose, that means it rules out and 30 milligram percent or more uh, is likely to be the CSF. The other tests which are more sensitive uh, specific are beta 2 transferrin and beta test protein, which we have discussed. But if you cannot uh, collect the fluid because there may be intermittent leak or there may be very little quantity fluid coming out, then you can use radionucleotide cystinography or you can go for radiological diagnosis in the form of MRI or CT scan to find out uh, from where it is coming. The site could be from anticrine fossa, uh, from the posterior wall of the frontal sinus, cribriform plate, ethmoid sinus roof, or lateral lamina, which are important. So you should know uh, from where uh, this uh, thing is coming the middle cranial fossa from the spinoid sinus or through the middle ear or from the posterior cranial fossa, again from the spinoid sinus or through the uh, middle ear through the eustachian tube, which we call it as paradoxical leak. Um, regarding the uh, etiology, it could be traumatic, uh, which can be after head injury or iatrogenic. The spontaneous rhinorrhea is very important because 50% of these are associated with raised ICP. So you have to uh, uh, I mean, treat the site of the leak and repair it when you go for surgery uh, and also the address the raised ICP, which occurs in about 50% of these patients. There could be congenital skull-based defect, which may be responsible for a leak in uh, maybe empty cella, or craniopharyngeal or craniohypophyseal canal or encephalocele, or there may be tumor, erosive disease, or inflammation responsible for leak. Um, I think I skipped this. Uh, we all know you can read uh, the various places, but what is important is that uh, the leak site could be uh, from the Mm, uh, the phobia ethmoidalis, which is site A, and it can be from the lateral lamina of the cribriform plate. So if there is an injury to the lateral lamina of the cribriform plate, uh, the leak occurs lateral to 
uh, the middle turbinate. So this is very important from where uh, the leak is coming in hydrogenic, apart from the cribriform or phobia or later lamina, you can have spinoid sinus or even the posterior wall of the uh, frontal sinus. In a spontaneous rhinorrhea, I have already discussed that it could be uh, there without raised ICP or with raised ICP. But the peculiar things which can occur in a spontaneous rhinorrhea, uh, or one should look especially at that there may be multiple sites of leak. At times when we see rhinorrhea, we, we find single leak, leak site and we, we, we are happy. So there may be multiple sites of leak, especially in the spontaneous rhinorrhea. These patients uh, may have a complete or partial empty cella, the tortuous optic nerve. There may be increased subarachnoid space around the optic nerve. And these patients may have intermittent headache, which is relieved by the leak. So the raised ICP is relieved by when there is a CSF leak. So the patient will have headache and then at the peak of the headache, there will be a leak. And then after that, for some days or some time, uh, the headache is relieved. So in such case, you, sus you should suspect that there may be, uh, there is a raised ICP and there is flattening of the posterior uh, eyeball uh, so in such case, you should suspect um, uh, idiopathic intracranial hypertension, uh, hypertension which is responsible for uh, um, leak. And these uh, spontaneous rhinorrhea are, are common in cribriform plate and the spinoid sinus. Uh, uh, am I uh, when uh, it is coming or? Yeah, it's not, we can okay. because light, no light has gone here. So no problem. There is a, uh, a perioptic seat prominence and the tortuous optic now. There may be empty cella and there may be flattening of the posterior uh, wall um, and posterior eyeball. Uh, in congenital, uh, we can have so many things. I think uh, these uh, I skip because of the interest of time. The miscellaneous, you can have tumor, infection, mucosal, and following radiations. Uh, the very important thing is the imaging. Uh, so uh, we have to find out the site. So there can be active leak and inactive leak. Most of the active leak uh, in most of the investigation, you can find out from it is from where it is coming. But in inactive leak, in some cases, um, it may be difficult to find out uh, from where it is coming. So we have to uh, go for special uh, test. Um, uh, we can use wall salva maneuver and jugular venous compression, but uh, it is controversial. There may be difficulty to detect the site of leak when there's inactive leak, and there may be more than uh, one site leak that is multiple leak, especially in the spontaneous rhinorrhea and trauma. Uh, and there may be problem um, the localization leak uh, because the CSF uh, can flow from right to left or left to right, so it may be difficult to find out from where it is coming especially when you have nasal septal defect or the rhinorrhea coming from uh, spinoid sinus um, uh, where, where there may be incomplete septa. And sometimes all investigations may uh, fail to find out wh 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 where is the site. Regarding the investigations, uh, HRCT or MR cystinography are the primary investigation of choice. The combined modalities have higher sensitivity and specificity, and these are both complementary because CT scan detects uh, the bony defect well. The MRI is better for uh, fluid and uh, soft tissue, so they are complementary. But getting both the investigations uh, may not be cost effective, especially in the country 
uh, where the patients are not able to afford both of these investigations. So in such situations, CT systemography uh, is the acceptable method, which is very useful in active leak. Um, for detail, I think I recommend you to, uh, to read this uh, diagnosis of CSF rhinore, which is very well written um, in endoscopic surgery, a comprehensive approach. Um, <clears throat> regarding the various uh, investigations, high resolution CT scan um, uh, is, uh, there are advantages because there, has, there is a visualization bone defect better then the MRI, um, and it is readily available, it's cost-effective, multiplanar reconstruction is possible. So therefore, if you find a single bone defect and it corresponds with the site of the leak on right side, and if you find a defect there, it's good enough. Uh, but there are limitations. Uh, it's difficult to detect the fluid, um, and it does not determine uh, which site is leaking when you have multiple bone defect. There is a radius and exposure does not distinguish between a dehiscent and a thin non-dehiscent wall and does not distinguish between a secretion from the CSF. Uh, so uh, the other investigations could be MRI and the MR systemography, which are highly T2 weighted and 3D sequences are taken. Uh, good sensitivity, even if there is an inactive leak. So even if there is an inactive leak, this is the investigation. Excellent soft tissue resolution is there. Multiplanar reformat can be done. Uh, differentiate between a man meningeal seal and encephalocele. And the additional finding, if you have a spontaneous rhinorrhea, uh, it can also diagnose idiopathic intracranial hypertension and the findings which I have already discussed, like empty cella, the tortuous uh, optic nerve, the dilated subarachnoid space, and the, the, the compression on the uh, eyeball. And there is no radiation exposure, but there are limitations, poor visualization of the bony defect. And therefore, if you combine both uh, CT and MR, uh, it is better. Um, it is expensive and may be difficult to differentiate between secretion and CSF. Um, the other modality is the CT cisternography, contrast enhance, the intrathecal uh, uh, iodine uh, uh, contrast is injected, uh, better for depiction of actively. So whenever there is active leak uh, and if there are source reconstrain, and if there are multiple bony defect on CT scan, you can uh, go ahead and do this. It differentiate between the, uh, the dense secretion and the blood, and the high resolution images are good for uh, bony defects, and it is cost effective, but it is invasive and uh, difficult to detect the low flow uh, when you have very low flow rhinorrhea. The other uh, investigation is contrast enhanced MRI where uh, intrathecal injection of gadolinium is given. So it depicts meningocele better. There is a better differentiation of hyper intense contrast from bone and the secretion, which is not possible by uh, the CT or MRI. The image uh, imaging can be done up to 48 hours. So it is better than the CT cisternography because in that case you do it, uh, I mean, the contrast disappear very fast. So you have to do it uh, after half an hour to maybe uh, when two, three hours, but after that it disappears. But in this, because contrast stays for some time. So if there's an intermittent leak, then you can use this uh, contrast enhanced MRI, but it's uh, invasive intrathecal injection of gadolinium is not US FDA approved. There may be behavioral and neurological problem. The intrathecal fluorescein also has been used. It's good, but it is again invasive 
the intrathecal uh, injection of fluorescein is not uh, FDA approved and there may be seizure in high concentration. So you have to use it um, very slowly and in dilute concentration and you inject it uh, over the period of 30 minutes. Um, the radionucleotide cystinography obviously is good when you cannot uh, collect uh, fluid um, and you can use uh, uh, various agents like technetium and indium which can stay for longer period. So it is useful for intermittent leak, but the limitations is again, it is invasive and it does not localize um, the site uh, very well. Uh, uh, so it's not very useful unless you have no other investigations available. Nasal endoscopy is also uh, allows you to directly visualize the defect site when the other method fails. Uh, but it may not be effective when there's uh, intermittent leak and when there is a minimal CSF leak. So to summarize the investigation, there may be active or inactive. Inactive, uh, you can go for uh, uh, high resolution CT and it is enough uh, when uh, there is only a single defect. But if their uh, CT does not differentiate between mucosa mucus and the blood uh, and the CSF. In that case, you can go for MR cysternography. And um, if, if you fail to differentiate between a dyscent and non dyscent wall in the CT scan, then also you can go for MR cysternography. Uh, then the other investigation may be the multiple, uh, I mean, CT cystinography. Uh, I have discussed that it is uh, uh, the alternate method, especially in the resource constraint. And it is especially useful when there are multiple defects. So uh, it will differentiate which side it is leaking. Uh, and um, also, uh, but it is useful when there is an active leak, not in intermittent. But when there is an intermittent leak, so in intermittent, you can have active. Uh, in that case, you can go for CT cystinography or MR cystinography. But if there is inactive leak, then MR cystinography or contrast enhanced MR cystinography, fluorescence or radionuclide with limited indications can perform. The nasal endoscopy, when everything other fails, then you can go for preoperative endoscopy and find out uh, with or without uh, fluorescein. Uh, CT angiography uh, has very limited indication, but if you have a traumatic uh, leak, which is coming from the lateral wall of the spinoid sinus, and it is a traumatic, so in that case, you should always try to find uh, rule out pseudoaneurysm along with this, and especially useful when there's associated SAH. Uh, now in the investigation, you must find out, especially when it is coming from the anterior um, ethmoid, whether it is coming uh, medial to the middle turbinate or lateral to the uh, middle turbinate. So if it is coming from medial to the middle turbinate, um, uh, then the direct approach can be taken. But if it is coming lateral to the middle turbinate, when there's a injury to the phobia ethmoidalis or the lateral lamina, so the lateral to the middle turbinate, it can occur when there's a injury to the phobia or injury to the lateral lamina of the cribriform plate. But if you have injury to the cribriform plate in the floor, then it comes from the medial side. So it is important. One can differentiate between anterior and posterior ethmoid by presence or absence of the crista cali, uh, which is there only in the anterior. And uh, the anterior ethmoid cell has a deep cribriform plate, which is not there in the posterior ethmoid layer cells. Um, I think uh, the defect in the spinoid sinus can be there in the roof, 
lateral wall, anterior wall, and posterior wall. Usually, the lateral wall of the spinoid sinus has larger defect, and these have high possibility of recurrence. And another reason why they have a high chance of recurrence is difficult to, to differentiate um, when it is well pneumatized, which I'll discuss. So here you can see that if the, the defect is there in the um, lateral recess of the sphenoid sinus here, so if there is a leak from here, it is difficult to, to reach by uh, remaining in the nasal cavity. So you have to remove the medial wall of the uh, sphenoid sinus, the posterior wall of the sphenoid sinus, the, mm, the, the pterygopalatine fossa, and then only you can reach there. So all these things need to be removed, and then only you can visualize this, uh, especially when there's a well pneumatized lateral recess. Um, so it is important. Usually the VDN now and the foramen rotundum is by side by side, but when there's a well pneumatized uh, uh, sphenoid sinus lateral recess, in that case the VDN now and the uh, and the uh, foramen rotundum uh, becomes very far apart, and you have to know this anatomy. I will not go into the details of pterygopalatine fossa, but it is an important structure um, and you should know the content and from there the pathology can reach into the orbit, nose, infratemporal fossa, the temporal lobe uh, and the other structures. Usually uh, we don't see the VDN foramen when we go for the normal uh, endoscopy. So at times we become uh, confused. Uh, so you may come across a foramen, which is usually palatovaginal foramen and not the VDN uh, now in a normal endoscopic nasal endoscopy. So unless you drill the medial pterygoid uh, wedge, um, uh, so if you drill it, then only you will see the, the VDN. Uh, Canal. Regarding the management of the CSF uh, leak, you can have conservative treatment. So most of the traumatic rhinorrhea can be managed, 90% of them. Uh, so you can observe for two to four weeks after the trauma or operation. But uh, some surgeons believe that observations seven to 10 days are enough. Um, uh, you can use acetazolamide, laxative, prophylactic antibiotics, although controversial, head and elevation, avoidance of sneezing or lumbar drain or drip dry LP uh, during the conservative management. There's a controversy regarding the use of uh, estrazolamide, antibiotic lumbar drain, and the post-operative bed rest and the duration also, and the type of the graft, whether you should use free or vascularized graft, especially in small leak or low flow uh, leak, but when there is a large leak and uh, high flow in such case, obviously vascularize or multi-layer multi, uh, closure is better. Uh, use of fluorescein also is controversial uh, and whether you should use underlay or overlay uh, technique again is controversial. The rep reports are same, uh, results are same, um, especially when there's a uh, low flow leak. And use of uh, fibrin glue is again controversial. Uh, in a review uh, which studied uh, 67 uh, studied, and uh, they, uh, they questioned the, the uh, 13 practices from the neurosurgeon, and uh, then they came with the evidence, uh, grade, uh, I mean B evidence, that there is no uh, routine use of prophylactic, there is no role of routine use of prophylactic antibiotics, uh, no uh, role of routine use of lumbar drain, and the various technique um, uh, use uh, have similar results, uh, especially in low flow, for larger defect, it is better to use vascularized flap. 
and uh, no relevant study to address the post-operative activity restriction, how long uh, you should have a rest in the bed. But uh, they they also find, uh, I mean, there was consensus. Most people agreed that if you, uh, if there is a neurosurgeon and a ENT surgeon, and when you use attention, I mean, attention to the site of the leak very well, and preparation of the graft bed very well, preparation of the graft bed, and securing the graft in place um, have ultimate uh, role and post-operative care. Uh, if it is done very well, then the success rate is high. Um, regarding estrozolamide, there is no re need to for routine use when there is no evidence of raised ICP. Rather, it is harmful because it can produce metabolic and electrolyte uh, disturbances. But yes, it, it can be used when there is a evidence of raise in recurrent pressure. Um, in the operative technique, surgery is indicated uh, for prevention of infection when conservative treatment fails. And I have said that in the early period, within first three weeks, there is about 10% risk of meningitis and then 10% annually. And therefore, these patients should be operated if, they don't, uh, if the leak does not stop. Uh, there is a more risk in the early period. The indication of surgery, traumatic leak, um, when it recurs or persists after two weeks of conservative treatment, all spontaneous uh, rhinorrhea should be operated. Leak associated with erosion or destruction of the skull base or sinus, or there is associated congenital defect, or there is a delayed leak or presented after one week of trauma or intermittent leak, the high pressure leak, that is intermittent leak with headache, which is relieved by the leak also should be operated and when you have recurrent meningitis. And you don't have to wait when there's a fracture displacement of more than one centimeter, there is continuous profuse leak, even if it is a traumatic leak, so in such case, you should go in early. If there's an encephalocele or meningocele, which is protruding through the skull uh, bony defect, because that prevents healing. And there's a preventing, uh, penetrating injury, combinated fractures, and enlarging pneumocephalus. In such case, you should go in early. There is intracranial uh, I mean, approach and endoscopic transnasal approach. Uh, success rate of intracranial versus endoscopy, uh, it is 70 to 80% of the intracranial and 86 to 100% in endoscopic. So endoscopy is better and the morbidity uh, are high in the intracranial approach. Uh, so, But there are indications of intracranial approach when there's extensive bony defect there are multiple bone fractures involving cranial, the face and the orbit. And if there are multiple sites, or if you are not able to detect from where the leak is coming. So in that case, you can use a large galea flap and cover it over the anterocranial fossa. And if there is associated uh, uh, hematoma or infection, which requires surgery, intracranial surgery. So in that case, also you should go severe, recurrent, or the, the patients which are not amenable to endoscopic surgery. So the the advantage of intracranial approach is uh, that it can cover the entire entire anterior fossa when there's multiple uh, bone defects, the large defect, or the site is not known, or associated lesions or the lesions which are not amenable, amenable to endoscopic surgery. There may be uh, irrational approach, uh, which can be taken um, uh, in the cranial approaches, which uh, one of our colleague, Dr. Sina, has advised. It is an extradural approach, but I think even the intradural can be done, especially if the defect is there, uh, which is anteriorly placed, because if you go, um, supraorbital, it is difficult to see um, the, the posterior wall there. 
So in such case, it may be useful. The endoscopic repair can be done in children also. Uh, <clears throat> the endoscopic approach has changed the treatment of CSF rhinorrhea. The success rate in first attempt is 90% and about 95 to 98% in second attempt. There's a less morbidity. The sense of smell is almost always preserved. Short hospital stay, craniotomy can be avoided. And uh, so endoscopic approach is best suited when there's a small defect in the sphenoid sinus, cribriform plate, anterior posterior sinus, but may be difficult when the defect is large and there in the lateral recess of the frontal sinus or the sphenoid sinus in which case you, you uh, have to remove the medial wall of the sphenoid sinus and pterygopalatine uh, uh, fossa. Uh, <clears throat> so, the, uh, uh, I mean, the repair can be direct, medial, paraceptal uh, approach when the defect is there in the cribriform plate or medial to the middle turbinate. But when it is lateral to the middle turbinate, then either coming from the lateral lamina of the cribriform plate here, or from the phobia ethmoidal list, then you have to go from uh, the lateral to the, the middle turbinate. And if you have uh, sight, uh, the defect coming from frontal sinus, you can have direct approach, uh, which I'll discuss, or uh, uh, you might have to require uh, middle turbinate me or superior turbinate me in selected patient. And if a sphenoidectomy is required when there is a leak from the sphenoid sinus. Um, general anesthesia had an elevation endotracheal tube, uh, epinephrine solution for vasoconstriction, thorough inspection of the nasal cavity. You should go from the superior to the inferior side. If you go from inferior to the superior side, then you may have false impression of leak coming from lower down. Uh, the, one can use uh, various endoscope. The instruments are generally passed below the endoscope. The endoscope pushes the uh, nose superiorly. And uh, we can use 30 centimeter uh, scope and uh, or 18 centimeter uh, uh, for bimanual dissection, the 30 centimeter long uh, telescope keeps camera, a cable, and the telescope away from uh, the operative area and it allows by manual dissection. You can use telescope holder or the assistant can be holding for you. There is a role of um, yellow filter for endoscope and blue filter uh, for light source. The leak uh, is identified and then about five millimeter mucosa is removed. So it is important at least five millimeter or more mucosa from all directions should be removed from the site of leak and the bone should be re removed sufficiently to delineate the dural defect. And if there are bony uh, projection or spicule, those also should be uh, removed for better graft placement and if there is an seal, you have to reduce it, cauterize it, and um, cut it. Uh, you can have overlay that is uh, outside the bone. So this is in relation to the skull, not in relation to the dura. So overlay means outside the dura, and inlay means inside. Oh, sorry, outside the bone, and um, underlay is inside the dura. Uh, sorry, bone and outside the dura, but there can be intradural also or combined technique can be used for repair. The topical fluorescein has a role and it can be placed medial to the middle turbinate and anterior to the sphenoid sinus if there is a difficulty in identification of a leak paraoperative. So the fluorescein, topical fluorescein, if you put it then it converts from yellow brown to the green when there is a leak coming from that particular place. And uh, it is helpful in detection of multiple sites of the leak. 
Um, you can have graded leak. You can have various uh, things which can be repaired, like a sponge, fat, vascularized flap, tissue glue, CSF diversion, and you can use buttress or support, which can, can be temporary or permanent in the form temporary in the form of marrow seal or follies, permanent in uh, in the form of bone or cartilage, especially if the defect is uh, large. Uh, so in various grades of CSF leak, which can vary from zero to three, uh, when there's a, a no leak detected uh, with intact uh, arachnoid, in that case, just put in uh, the sponge, uh, it's enough. But if the leak is coming and there is a uh, 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 no obvious tear, but in that case, uh, can use hemostatic sponge and the sealant. Um, if there is a moderate leak and you can see the arachnoid tear, in that case, use fat and the sealant. But if the defect is large and large CSF leak, in that case, use fat, the nasoceptor flap, sealant, and also use rigid buttress. Um, uh, whether permanent or temporary. If you use permanent, then you have to put it below the, uh, the vascularized flap. Various graft material can be cartilage, bone, muco uh, chondrium, mucosa, turbinate, etc. Bath plug technique uh, is very popular and useful. Uh, it is useful in the anterior fossa you can have button technique, which I'll be showing in one of my surgery, um, that you can have intradural fat, you can put it and which should be a little larger than the dural defect and the extra dural uh, fat also, and you tie both of them. Um, <clears throat> so bath plug technique and button technique can be used. There can be sandwich technique in which if the defect is large, you can use um, the uh, the bone or the cartilage, and you can rotate this uh, bone or cartilage so that it uh, acts as a gasket seal for the last uh, defect. The subdural graft can also be placed, um, and the multiple layer. Um, but when you use multiple layer technique, then uh, preferably you should avoid using the fat or any other tissue in between the bone and the vascularized flap because the, uh, the healing occurs good when the bone is raw. So don't put in fat between the vascularized flap and the, uh, and the bone when you use multiple layer technique. Um, uh, the support, you can use packing the gauze piece, follies or marrow seal, or bone or cartilage. Um, obliteration technique can be used when you are not sure. So remove all the mucosa and then put in fat there, uh, especially useful in the sphenoid sinus. Uh, the vascularized flap uh, is better. Uh, uh, y flap against graft, re replace like with like. So mucosa with the mucosa, faster healing and uh, resist radiotherapy, um, both inlay and uh, only technique yields uh, similar result. For a small uh, defect, you can use any of the technique, results are good, but if it is a high flow, in the, those cases, multilayer closer or pedicle vascularized flap is better. If there is an associated raise ICP, you need to address that also. Apart from uh, treating, I mean, closing the defect, you have to address the raise ICP postoperatively. Uh, you avoid any dead space or if there is a sharp bony spicule that must be uh, drilled uh, so that, uh, I mean, the graft uh, is placed uh, perfectly on the bone. Um, no fibrin glue between the layer. I have seen many people putting in, if you need to put in uh, glue, then you just put in at the margin of multi-layer closure. But if you put in fibrin glue between the layer, it uh, prevents a good healing 
or and fibrosis, which is absolutely must for good repair and permanent uh, closure of the leak. Uh, uh, layer of surgery cell or gel form is put in at the margin of the graft. It prevents migration and packing with marrow seal uh, gauze or balloon uh, impregnated with antibiotic should be done. The gel form should separate graft from the packing material. Otherwise, when you uh, remove the, the packing material, uh, the graft may also can avulge. So uh, one uh, packing material can be removed uh, three to five days, or it can be kept when there is a, a large defect for a longer period. Uh, also, bed rest, again controversial, but three to five days with the head and elevation may be done, but in elderly patient may not be, uh, I mean, you might have to go for early mobilization. And many people advocate early mobilization. The role of navigation, uh, when it is difficult to localize the defect, especially for the beginner, perioperative antibiotic, again controversial, avoid nasal blowing, sneezing or valsalva maneuver. And if there is a sneezing, then you advise them that uh, they should open mouth so that there is no built up of uh, raised pressure inside the nose and, and um, a recurrence of leak. A stool softener should be avoid uh, should be used to avoid straining after surgery. Uh, you can suture the uh, the graft or uh, I mean the uh, whatever facial atta or the fat to the dura uh, uh, to prevent migration of this. This is a short video. I'll quickly finish this. So this was a creepy form plate defect. Uh, I'm sorry, the talk is a little longer. So the graft was taken. Although for a small defect, uh, there is no need for vascularized flap, but um, you can take it, it is better. So we try to localize the defect, there was a meningocele here and uh, the mucosa all around the, the suspected defect was, uh, was removed and then we could see the CSF leaking from there. There was less space, so part of the middle turbinate was removed to give little more space. The mucosa was cauterized around uh, uh, the defect and the defect was delineated. So uh, if you place mucosa over the mucosa, then there will be no healing. So you should make this raw and then uh, we use the button technique. So we put uh, the intradural fat and uh, which was little larger than the uh, the defect, so intradural fat, and then the fat outside, uh, uh, and then both these uh, uh, the uh, when uh, fat graft were uh, tied uh, to prevent migration, and then uh, the vascularized flap also was uh, put in. Uh, so this was poor enthusiastic, you can say, but otherwise a small defect, you can, simple closure may be enough. Uh, so this is glue. Then you put in uh, a gel or marrow seal after that. And that's all. So in frontal uh, CSF rhinorrhea, uh, you can see that if the defect uh, leak is from the lateral recess of the frontal sinus, it is difficult to approach from uh, ipsilateral side. If you go from the opposite side, then you can reach 
more laterally. So uh, you can have either a direct approach through the frontal sinus, which I'll also discuss, uh, or you can have from the opposite side and remove the superior uh, portion of the nasal septum and go from the other side. So modified lithrop. Um, so these are the example when you use a straight instrument, you can reach up to the hair from the ipsilateral side. But if you go from the opposite side, you can reach little more lateral. But still, if the if, if the leak is from the extreme lateral side, the straight instrument will not reach. So from opposite side and then uh, uh, through the nasal septum and using the curved tip instrument, you can reach the opposite side, even the well pneumatized frontal sinus. Uh, extreme side or you can go for direct opening of the frontal sinus which was uh, described by one of our colleagues uh, so anti wall of the frontal sinus um, pre-side can be removed and then flap raised then you use endoscope and repair it so results for 90 percent success in endoscopy but the recurrence may occur even very late. So one should not be happy if you post-operatively you find that there is no CSF leak uh, because the recurrence may occur even after many years, 80 months in Kessner series at all. So long follow-up is required before you um, say that the procedure is successful. Complications are many, meningitis, chronic headache, pneumocephalus, hematoma, frontal lobe abscess, recurrence, flap necrosis, sudden nose deformity, mucosal, if you don't remove mucosa, anosmia, seizure, memory disturbance, and the only changes. Flap may get evolves or there may be flap necrosis, especially if you use balloon and you use too much of pressure. So vascularity of the flap may be compromised, so you have to be careful adrenose deformity also um, can occur. The recurrence uh, occurs in spontaneous rhinorrhea. So one should be careful when you have spontaneous rhinorrhea. 50% of them have raised ICP. So repair the defect and address the raised IC. And it is more when there's an elevated body mass index, lateral races from spinoid sinus, because these are difficult and you can miss the extensive skull base defect, middle is obese female, empty cella, raise ICP, multiple sites, so you can miss one of these diabetes and the well pneumatized frontal sinus uh, uh, recess. So address the raise ICP, um, and it can be done by uh, continuous. Um, uh, you, you can go for perioperative ICP monitoring after you, uh, uh, I mean, uh, post-operatively you can press, you measure the pressure. And if there is a raised ICP, especially in the spontaneous rhinorrhea, then you have to uh, treat the raised ICP also. So a special problem of raised ICP, multiple skull base defect may be there and they may be leaking. So if you find one defect, you should not be happy. The, the high rate um, of meningocele uh, formation, CSF pressures should be routinely measured after surgery, especially in spontaneous rhinorrhea. Uh, Dr. Jankir, uh, Jankiram has also very nice uh, chapter written. You can refer this. Uh, there are indication of lumbar drain, but there are these are very little recurrent, persistent leak associated with hydrocephalus, raised ICP, two cisterns or third ventricle has been opened, large defect with meningocele, uh, body mass index more than 30, and empty cell syndrome. Um, you can keep it for three to five days, and then you may have continuous drain or intermittent drain and then in intermittent drain you can drain it um, per hour or twice in a day 
uh, I think intermittent drain twice in a day may be, may be all right. We have these three um, endoscopic uh, program. One is the university certified 11 month program for endoscopic fellowship and another WFNS postgraduate training course for three months. So for both of them, this stipend is offered to the neurosurgeon or the fellow. And there is one week fellowship short term, which we conduct every uh, twice in a year. So I think I have dealt to summarize, identify that the fluid is uh, CSF and not the nasal fluid. Uh, if there is a raised ICP, you have to have, uh, you should make sure that there is no raised ICP. If it is raised ICP, then address that. Uh, and there may be multiple site of leak in spontaneous rhinorrhea. HRCT is good enough for single this thing and uh, defect. MR cystinography, CT cystinography have role. Topical fluorescein can be used. Intraoperative if you have difficulties and uh, flap should be on the raw surface and avoid fascia or fat in between the bone and the flap. And at least five millimeter of the mucosa should be removed. Recurrence may happen even very late. And uh, uh, there are risk factors for recurrence uh, in spontaneous rhinorrhea and obese patient. Um, there may be difficulty in uh, doing surgery when there's a late releases of the sphenoid sinus and frontal sinus. The indication of lumbar drain are very minimal and intracranial approach also um, has selected indications when extensive bone defect, multiple fractures or unknown site or there's associated intracranial. Uh, you can refer to this uh, book. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sorry, the topic was a little long. Yeah. Uh, that was uh, in a Absolutely, like something like you know that uh, hundred books, uh, hundred years of experience covered in one hour, sir. Thank you for the lucid presentation. You have probably explained every possible aspect, complications. So that's why I think I see very less questions over there. But still, there are two questions before handing it over to panelists. Uh, Doctor Surendra Koisa has asked: Is chronic cough a relative contraindication? Doctor Swami, I think before yes, that, uh, please. Please uh, request, I mean, panelists to have their comments and then okay. uh, we can address quickly. The, the Dr. Sorry. Surendra will come to you later. Uh, excellent. Uh, these people are uh, have extensive experience and your own comment also, please. Thank you. Uh, we are in, indeed grateful that we have light panelists with us. And Dr. Prakash Noya, Dr. Avdesh, and Dr. Dattaraj, whom I've introduced in the beginning of the session. Uh, may I have your views, please? Dr. Avdesh. Uh, first of all, I would like to say uh, that uh, it was an excellent presentation. And Dr. Yadav, as usually, uh, usual, he has covered entire aspect of CSF Ranuria in this uh, presentation. Uh, very good. It was very lucid and uh, uh, in, very interesting. Just I would like to say uh, a few comments. Uh, let me tell you one thing that beta lactoferrin test is available very few centers and it's extremely expensive. Yes, Can somebody yes. uh, guess how expensive it is? It is one test costs 45,000. It is available in one private setup. It is uh, in Lucknow. It costs forty-five thousand. It's so much so ex expensive. The other thing I would like to say that we, in our experience, we have found out that uh, if some patient is having CSF rhinorrhea and associated post nasal drip, it is very likely that it is a uh, true CSF rhinorrhea rather than nasal secretion, and. Uh, this is simple observation, uh, although may not be correct 100%, but we have observed this. And the, the other thing that, uh, uh, sir, do you use cobalator in using your uh, uh, 
uh, uh, CSF uh, Ranula Management or you only use monopolar? Uh, I use, uh, but I don't have public, I work in an institute with very minimum facilities. So we don't have, therefore I don't use, but otherwise it is good, yes. Yes, it is a very good instrument. We have recently started using it and uh, because Cobalator has four properties. It uh, coagulates, it cuts, there is suction there and there is a irrigation also. And more was it, uh, the mechanism that the tissue is not charred. So it, uh, it gives very precise uh, uh, coagulation in a very uh, uh, precise place. It's a very good instrument. Anyway, thank you, sir. It was excellent. I really enjoyed it. Thank, thank you. you, Dr. Nadesh, for your tips. Definitely, I agree that you know that you know, beta transfusion facilities are not available. Maybe Lucknow is a much bigger place in a place like uh, in Jabalpur. Beta trans there's only one Lal Pathology lab, and they say that you know that they'll collect and send it to Delhi, and by the time it comes, the result comes, it takes around two to three months. So patient cannot wait. It's absolutely a valid point. May I have your views from Dr. Datta? Yeah, very nice presentation, sir. I think you have covered everything from uh, frontal sinus leak to all the like uh, lateral sinus, uh, spinoid sinus leaks. I think you have covered comprehensively. And one of the questions that, that was asked by Dr. Harshad, uh, most of them actually covered with over the period of this uh, complete lecture. But uh, uh, still, if he has some uh, like questions, we can address it later. But I think you have very nicely covered and. Uh, uh, I mean, to give, uh, say like even in surgical aspect, like the main point was like to identify the site of leak and uh, you are like various techniques. So, uh, uh, so what does it matter? Like if it is a nasoceptal flap present or not present, I want to say like if you do a structured repair, including intralay, overlay and uh, other like with sealant and use of uh, nicely use of fat, I think uh, uh, Presence or absence of Hadad doesn't make much difference if it is a uh, like, uh, small leak. So I think you have covered everything, including bath plug technique and all that gasket seal. So thank you, sir. Very nice presentation. Even it is always learning for us also to revisit those again, fine, uh, fine, fine techniques and uh, tricks. Yeah, that's what, whatever can be there on this particular earth that Dr. Yadav has covered extensively. Now we'll have a view from one more expert, Dr. Prakash. Prakash can throw much light. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he's expert in, uh, I mean, expanded approach. Yeah, please. Thank you so much for this extensive presentation. So you've covered, like everybody said everything. I would just like to ask you one more thing about uh, management of patients who have uh, benign intracranial hypertension. So a good percentage of our patients come to neurosurgery with uh, CSF leak. So how do you manage them after you've done the CSF leak repair? Yeah, so if we uh, confirm that uh, it is a benign intracranial hypertension, I usually, although there are some indications, empty cella and all those, but even after that, I try and do the uh, post, uh, I mean, three to five days after the repair, we go for uh, lumbar puncture and see whether there's a raised ICP. So if there is evidence of raised ICP or later on, uh, I, I tell them that if they have headache, um, then I go for LP shunt. So I do LP shunt if there is evidence of raised ICP, but if there's no evidence of raised ICP, then we hold on for some time. So this is actually a, uh, a very important point because uh, a lot of these patients, especially the young female patients in our uh, CSF leak uh, category, uh, of them, at least 30 to 40 percent patients will have features of benign intracranial hypertension. And at some point of time, they might, they, at least they need to be counseled regarding the need for a shunt. Um, yeah. The second thing I wanted to ask was regarding pneumococcal vaccination. So this is um, something that is often recommended in the West for patients who have had CSF rhinorrhea. So to decrease the risk of meningitis in populated organisms like pneumococcus. Do you advise uh, um, vaccination with pneumococcal vaccine after surgery? Um, I mean, uh, I have no idea. I think, uh, I don't know whether this thing is available or not. Uh, yeah, you have a valid point, yes. 
so pneumococcus uh, two doses uh, spaced over a period of 3 weeks after surgery uh, this is a protocol that is, is followed in many centers in the west so uh, yeah. it said decrease the risk of incidence of meningitis happening from uh, capsulated organisms uh, sir one mm -hmm. other uh, question uh, was regarding uh, the lateral recess leak from the sphenoid sinus so uh, what is uh, your take on uh, how you should repair them do you prefer to go in from the endonasal route or do you prefer to use the transcranial route for uh, repairing the lateral recess leak of the sphenoid sinus or frontal sinus okay. sphenoid sinus sphenoid sinus i take and uh, endonasal route and uh, i remove the medial wall of the uh, maxillary sinus also posterior wall and ppf uh, and then um uh, drill the base of the pterygoid plate medial part uh, and i make sure that i see the whole extent of the leak because this is important otherwise just even i mean using angled scope you can you can visualize it but doing a good repair you require a good exposure so i prefer the endonasal approach and i uh, want to see end on the defect uh, which so, can be done uh, lateral recess leak actually one in interesting finding was that invariably almost all of them say, tend to have a secondary pathology either in terms of uh, a dural leaf fistula causing uh, raised intracranial pressure or uh, benign intracranial hypertension causing raised pressure in fact we've also had a few patients who've had bilateral uh, leak from the uh, sphenoid sinus and in these cases the endonasal repair not only gives us uh, identification of both sides but it also lets us repair both sides at the same time by avoiding and avoiding a craniotomy so uh, so thank you so much sir this is uh, these are uh, very important points that you've covered yeah excellent you have uh, see we have been telling that in in a spontaneous rhinorrhea it is important to we feel uh, very nice if you find a single defect so in a spontaneous rhinorrhea there can be multiple site of leak uh, so we should try and uh, read the the images very well and then uh, and during surgery also try to find out Uh, the rule out at least multiple site of the leak thank you very much thank you yeah uh, again this uh, yeah again this lateral sinus uh, like spinoid sinus leak as you have mentioned and as like uh, dr prakash has thrown much light on that so it looks like easy sometime with angle scope you can see that opening and the the means like the beginner generally tend to put some fat into it and pack that sinus and feel that it can be like repaired but the valid point that have been raised that it required a good assessment of the pathology that it is causing it so like one of my patient had like uh, even uh, dural ev fistula you know like big fistula causing raised icp and until and unless you address it doesn't matter how many times you repair it it will fail it's not that only like doing extensive lateral repair which is a paramount important for this lateral recess like going into pterygoid plate and 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 actually uh, repairing it nicely but uh, the similar importance to be given to addressing the issue otherwise it will it is bound to fail so i mean uh, like these two points identifying the pathology and going for it and extensive repair by going uh, and identifying the complete anatomy of that leak is very important so doctor that in that case do you advise transcranial or tra uh, no, no, not transcranial uh, but as sir said like what i said it requires a good expertise to repair a lateral uh, sphenoid sinus leak these are not a small leak like generally whenever the tendency for a neurosurgeon or the endoscopy surgeon like csf leaks are the uh, easiest cases to be done or at the beginner to start with right so this scribri from plate leak kind of thing it may be easier but when it comes to the lateral sphenoid sinus leak one has to be very careful while addressing it it requires a good expertise for addressing uh, or understanding that anatomy and a good work up to correct that uh, pathology Th this was the yeah. point i wanted to make yeah certainly hrct will definitely play a part and i think it uh, dr prakash what uh, he raised the same question as asked by dr surendra now i think we can if uh, uh, all the, the points are covered by the panelist all their views are covered we can go for the question answers dr surendra has asked is chronic cough a relative contraindication any one of you can answer please chronic cough 
Um, I think you can address that uh, before also. Uh, and th that is a risk factor you can, uh, uh, but if there's, a, I don't know, I have not come across any such case in any of my patient of C. subrhinorea, chronic cough. But yes, important thing. Uh, and Professor Prakash, uh, Pro Professor Prakash Nair, please. Other panelists, uh, do you have any experience of this treating chronic cough, uh, recurrence with chronic cough? No, Dr. no. I need to say, like, if there is a curve, we have to definitely understand it that it is one of the pathology and you have to address it. It uh, means, like, whatever that so many etiological factors, for, for, it may be like hernia, right? <laughs> like before addressing hernia, oh, yeah. you have to treat a cup. So there is no question about it. If there is a meningitis, another problem, you don't wait for cup to resolve before treating it. So a clinical situation will uh, will help you to decide the urgency of treatment. Yeah, Prakash can address. No, chronic uh, cough person had a patient with chronic cough per se in this particular category, but uh, there are times when you have patients who have unfavorable body habitus and obstructive sleep apnea. And in that case, you might have to, not for case of leak repair per se, but for patients who have tumors or other conditions, where you might have to change your strategy and decide to do a transcranial procedure rather than an endonasal procedure. Uh, in patients where you might have high flow CSF leak. But chronic cough per se, I've not, never, really, never had to have a patient who had chronic cough in the setting of BIH. So I cannot answer that. Though I suspect that if you have a, if you have a patient who has chronic cough, you might be tempted to use a, la a larger nasoceptal flap. Flaps generally tend to have good take. And uh, they might be able to obviate the chance of, you know, graft getting dislodged. But I suppose after general anesthesia, the cuff itself is depressed over a particular part. By the time the tissue glow, another thing acts. But the long-term viability of durability of a repair is based upon uh, the tissue that, that you place. And the most reliable uh, kind of repair that you can give is a vascularized flap. Nasoceptal flaps inherently tend to start attaching very well to the pericondrium and the bone within a period of uh, 72 hours. So for a for any defect, your repair should be at least 30% larger than the defect. If your defect is well covered, especially with a flap, uh, I presume chronic cough should not be a problem. Yeah, your point well taken. And the same Dr. Surendra is asking, what are the incidence of hydrocephalus after repair? Anyone? Incidence of hydrocephalus. Uh, uh, I think there may be recurrence, uh, but if you follow them uh, long term and if it is undiagnosed, then uh, some of them uh, about 40 to 50 percent, as high as 40 to 50 percent have raised ICP, spontaneous rhinorrhea. Okay. And other cases also. So, if untreated, they may have hydrocephalus, or rather than having a hydrocephalus, they will have recurrence first. So, um, I think, uh, but we have not uh, come across hydrocephalus. There was uh, recurrence. There, there are series with where they have de uh, described that there are recurrences, and these were because of undetected uh, raised intracranial pressure. So that you should avoid. I think uh, Dr. Rahul Srinivasan have also asked, do we routinely... Yes, do I'm coming to that. Okay. I'm coming to that. I'm coming okay. to that. Dr. Ra Ra Rahul Srinivasan says that you know, they routinely use MRI flap, MRI to assess the viability of the flap. In the, sometimes because in his experience, he has found avascular flap in the, of the nasal mucosa. So if there's an avascular uh, flap, he doesn't take. So what's... Uh, your sub panelists experience in that? I think if if there is a re-surgery, then uh, you might have to think otherwise. If you have taken a good uh, flap and you have preserved the uh, the vascularity at the base, then there is no question. Or if you use uh, some foliage catheter and uh, and and use too much of pressure there, then it can produce avascular necrosis. 
otherwise uh, I mean, there is no need for mri to see the vascularity uh, for the flap and if you feel that there is no flap available then you can go for um, in uh, in low flow or uh, csf rhinorrhea even eva whether you use uh, um, uh, free graft or a flap the prognosis is same but if it is a high flow or a large defect in that case you if the vascularized flap is not available nasoceptal you can have from the lateral uh, um, i mean side flap and or even if it is not available then you go for multi layer closer i mean uh, what, what, what he means is something like you know that uh, you, um, do we really uh, do post operatively mri routinely to assess whether the flap has taken up or not uh, but probably you answered sir because you know that it's a avascular, a vascular flap and if the vascular flap uh, i mean other alternative is something like we are using routinely the non vascular flap also that also takes a fill so in case if something is there it will come as a recurrence so then only we do mri to assess that otherwise not required thank you sir thank you for answering uh, yes prakash where an early uh, post operative mri is done to assess tumor status and in those uh, scenarios a good vascularity of the flap can be assessed by seeing the contrast enhancement so your flap will have good contrast enhancement and that shows that the flap is adequately perfused uh, now there is a series from pittsburgh where they demonstrated the rate of flap necrosis and that is nearly 0.7% of all flaps and one modality of presentation is when a patient may present with foul smell features of uh, csf leak and features of meningitis and in that scenario an mri at that point of time can also show you the fact that the flap has necrosed and this might prompt alternative approaches like doing a lateral wall flap or doing a flap from the temporoparietal facial flap to reconstruct a large calbus defect so i think that is what dr rahul specifically refers to but um, i do not think that this might be a routine practice in most centers where a flap and mri is done to make the assessment of flap uh, specifically but an mri contrast can show whether the flap is taking uh, contrast well and if it is enhancing well it is it is evidence that the flap has got good vascularity yeah thank you thank you thank you for uh, you know uh, adding up uh, bring more light on this particular thing uh so uh, there's dr jan is asking uh, in case if there's a uh, pneumocranium and csf leakage putting a lumbar drain is it indicated or contraindicated he feels that it uh, forms an inverted bottle effect yeah if there is a, a pneumocephalus um, uh, post operatively or pre operatively post operatively if you uh, have i mean there are uh, indications for lumbar drain high flow leak uh, third ventricle has been open um the large defect uh, in that case you can use but not routinely and if there is enlarging pneumocephalus i think in that situation there is um, uh, it is rather a contraindication pneumocephalus so the last question is from dr lay rahman he says sometimes while removing the mucosa to expose the bony margins there are changes that bone might further be broken by the suction tube how to manage it and how to avoid it be what gentle <laughs> be gentle there is no option means i want to say like uh, uh, only thing that you have to do you have to be practice it you should not break you should not create more damages to repair one damage right <laughs> so you have to be very gentle there is no second option for it and if at all you repair i mean if you damage it there is no other option then again you have to repair it right <laughs> you put to fat plug again the same procedure that you are about to do for the first repair then do it for the second defect as well so be gentle no all tips and tricks so what sir has covered uh, is like uh, you you mean to say yeah, for each line there is a big chapter behind it so if you go for repair if you go for dissection identification of the defect and then so i mean to say you have to go into detail no things well be gentle with your approach and uh, technique 
and if at all you create defect then repair it as like we are addressing the this uh, webinar for csf leak defect no more questions in the question box uh, uh, somebody asked yeah, 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 yeah. uh, ask uh, uh, yes, if some patients come with uh, csf run with meningitis when you like to repair same setting or under antibiotic cover or after three week two week patient uh, having csf leak frank csf leak with meningitis yes yes so active meningitis should be treated first uh, so uh, i usually uh, try and avoid uh, uh, 7 to 10 days so give active meningitis should be treated uh, uh, later on you can go for uh, surgery 7 to 10 days of uh, uh, antibiotic cover and then uh, treat that at that time, during antibiotic cover, would you have to put lumbar drain? Not required unless uh, you think uh, if there is a raised ICP, I think uh, the drain is not required. Uh, the first aim is to treat meningitis and then uh, if the active phase is over, then you repair this. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Um, so this yeah. last question, I think anybody can answer other than the panelist also. Uh, Dr. Rahul Shivasta wants to know what is the dose of intrathecal fluorosin in case uh, we give it. Yeah, it should be given uh, in a dilute uh, 10% and uh, uh, it should be given very slowly over 30 minutes period. So... You dilute it to and make it uh, ten percent fluorescein, and it should be uh, uh, given over uh, uh, at least ten minutes uh, period, not thirty minutes. Sorry. Uh, uh, so do not give it fast and do not give it uh, the full concentration. Uh, one ml uh, can be diluted into. Uh, 10 ml, so that becomes 10% uh, uh, dilution and give it uh, for 10, uh, very slowly for 10 minutes. And then you do the endoscopy uh, after 30 minutes. Thank you, sir. Thank you. All the questions answered. <laughs> so, I thank, sincerely thank Professor uh, Yadav for uh, such Sorry, a lucid uh, presentation and, and all the panelists for joining us sir, and then you. enlightening us and enlightening the viewers. Harshad, was, sir. Harshad, sir, wants to say something. Parikh, sir. Please, thank, sir. Thank you, Dr. Yadav. Once again, you come out with uh, excellent, exorbitant and exhaustive lecture of all the facets of the CSF rhinoid. Wonderfully explained. One inquisitive question is that, suppose patient comes with a rhinorrhea and you are sure it is CSA and you are not able to demonstrate the exact site of leak which can happen in a small leak. How do you tackle that problem? Sir, there are two things. Um, I have uh, uh, one mm. case, I have said uh, the indication for lumbar uh, when if you suspect that there is a raised icp then i have used i think in one or two case um, the lp shunt and i was fortunate that uh, it worked because there was associated raised icp so we addressed raised icp and possibly it uh, cured the other uh, <clears throat> i have not come across this and i have not uh, done this but literature says that if you are not able to demonstrate <laughs> height of leak, then possibly it is from the anterior fossa, these cribiform uh, place, um, and then you just, uh, I mean, place the large uh, vascularized flap onto the uh, anterior fossa, that is intracranial approach. So un unknown site of the leak, you place a large vascularized flap onto the uh, <coughs> bilateral anterior fossa, uh, 
uh, if you have bilateral leak or otherwise on one side, if you have that, uh, but if you are not able to detect the site of leak. <coughs> in the cases of benign intracranial hypertension presenting with CSF rhinorrhea, do you advocate that we should put a shunt in first or we should repair the CSF rhinorrhea? Um, uh, we repair the rhinorrhea first, sir, and then uh, post-operatively we see that if there is a raised ICP, either uh, I mean, uh, in the post-operative period or even later on, also because there can be long-term uh, recurrence. So, uh, if there is a raised ICP, features of raised ICP or, or lumbar puncture shows uh, uh, or ICP monitoring shows that there is a raised pressure, then you have to address that raised pressure and I do a LP shunt in such cases. Because usually the ventricles are not dilated. That, you are, in my experience, I have just put a shunt in and not repaired and fortunately I have been lucky to have that CSF rhinorrhea to, to stop in these patients. Uh, just uh, wanted to know your experience about lumbar drains post-operative, whether to put or not, is really uh, difficult to address. But I, in whenever I have put a lumbar drain, I do a gradual drainage every hourly or every two hourly, not the continuous drainage. In one patient, I had done a continuous drainage and there was severe pneumocephalus. The pneumocephalus was so much that, that it was causing a raised pressure. Of course, with the bed rest and with the hyperoxygenation and all, it subsided. But this is one thing somebody was asking about pneumocephalus and lumbar drain. I think one should avoid putting a lumbar drain in presence of pneumocephalus. It will suck the air inside. In Olden days, we used to do lumbar punctures drainage every day in head injury patients when I was in JJ hospital as a junior person and CSF leak used to stop in three to four days. But nowadays, many people are just saying, okay, no, don't do anything, repair the CSF leak to prevent the meningitis. In occasional cases, we have seen that meningitis sets in very fast. In head injury cases, can I, just add, because, uh, I, can I just add to that regarding uh, specifically use of lumbar drain? Uh, yeah. So, for, first of all, for spontaneous CSF rhinorrhea, where the defect is on the cribriform plate, so usually you have a small defect. And uh, I have, I'm in a center where we started using lumbar drain quite early. It's very useful when you're a beginner because using fluorescein for the lumbar drain one gives you very good identification of the first site of leak. It will also allow you to identify a second site of leak if it is suspected on your imaging. And it becomes a very useful tool in that particular case. Thirdly, if you are giving fluorescein, it also allows you to assess the robustness of your repair. Which means that if you repaired your CSF leak and you're giving Valsalva and waiting for a period of 15 minutes, not having any CSF leak in the form of fluorescein in the nasal cavity, it tells you that your repair is robust. So there are advantages. So we don't use lumbar drain for all our CSF leak repair patients. If you have a doubt regarding the site of leak, or if you have a doubt regarding the number of leaks, fluorescein and lumbar drain is a useful tool. That's the first thing. The second thing is regarding the nature of drainage. So we routinely advocate drainage of only 5 to 10 ml per hour. And this can be titrated based upon the presence of patient's headache. Sometimes patients will complain of significant headache. And so we do not drain on a continuous basis. We never keep the lumbar drain open on a continuous basis. You give strict instructions for 5 to 10 ml of drainage. And this is possible. We routinely do it in our center. Third thing is regarding pneumocephalus. So if your patient has pneumocephalus following CSF or your repair, it indicates that you're robust. Your, your repair is either not robust or you missed the site of pain. And uh, that is what is causing the air to go in. And uh, so uh, I think that there is a lesson to be learned there in the sense that if that is happening, it is possible that we have not repaired the defect adequately. So um, if you have a patient who has come to you with CSF rhinorrhea, say post-trauma or uh, post-operative also, who has pneumocephalus, then the lumbar drain should not be open till the repair has been adequately done. So we do the repair first, put our flap, and then ask the uh, anesthetist to open the lumbar drain. 
So there is a definite role of using lumbertrain, and there is a definite role of using furosemide derivative. No, I agree. We use the same way the lumbar drainage. Uh, I'm talking about one patient where I had a tough time, where the lumbar drain was a little over drained, and you have to be doing a very gradual, and uh, five ml, ten ml per hour or two hours, and we gradually go to six hours drainage and then stop it completely. It really helps to reduce the CSF rhinorrhea recurrences. There is no doubt about it. And uh, in olden days, as I said, we you always used to do a lumbar I'm saying that it really works very well for us. Okay, Thank you, Dr. Yadav. Thank you. Okay, Narayan, you're muted. You're muted. You're muted. There you go. Dr. Narayan, you are muted. So unmute yourself. Yes, yes, yes. I think uh, since uh, Dr. Ashwin and Dr. Prakash were discussing about lumbar drain, Dr. Surendra has uh, 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 said that, that you know that uh, what is uh, uh, the alternative that if we do uh, third ventriculostomy? Uh -huh. mm, no, no. Did, did you get that question? No, no. Oh, try, try it again. Uh. No, 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 no third ventriculostomy. Okay. okay. Okay, I guess we can wrap it up. Uh, uh, thank uh, Dr. Yadav for, for, for a great continuation. You know, this is how Zoom should work. Interactivity, getting a lot of people involved. And you guys did an excellent job of that today, showing how Zoom can work. I'm sure a lot of residents watch this uh, and they're going to get a lot from it. And uh, next week, uh, Dr. Yadav, what's the topic? Um. Do you have it with you there? If you don't, I don't yeah, want to push you in the spot. I'll, I'll just see. Uh, I think um, what is the topic? Yeah. So I'll, this is uh, endoscopic, endoscopic third ventriculostomy. Okay, very good. We look forward. We see. Thanks for the, all the panelists team too for adding to a great webcast. See you, thank gentlemen. You, thank you. Thank you, Adil, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir.